بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear brothers and sisters, throughout this blessed session we've been learning from our esteemed leaders, scholars and teachers about this critical task that has come to each of us how in a moment of incredible pain, unspeakable hardship, when others in the Ummah and in our human family are tested in the face of a genocide, in the face of systemic war, in the state face of seemingly endless injustices, how do we who have generally been tested with relative freedom, relative comfort, relative education and opportunity, step up to our responsibility at this hour? And I want to argue to you and share with you so that we can take home from what we learn from all of our speakers, something actionable in our families and our communities. I want to share with you that, you know, especially as Americans in the modern world, we love a good hero. But I want to challenge you and suggest that heroic acts are not just reserved, with all due respect, to political leaders or to larger than life figures. They're not reserved for eloquent people or for mashayikh and imma and teachers. Heroic acts are usually the acts of ordinary people like you and I. And often it is those acts by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about change, literally a lens that refracts the light of the Qur'an al-Kareem in society. In the Holy Qur'an in Surah Al-Sajda, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajeem, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا Allah says, and we made from amongst them leaders guiding to us by, by our command when they firmly believed in our signs and patiently persevered. In fact, there is a memory that sometimes our community conjures, creates, calls to memory, a memory of a man who is undoubtedly great. A memory of our brother and a great leader of this Ummah Rahimahullah, but a memory that sometimes we are guilty of casting in other than its light. Let me describe to you this memory by way of a comic. In a comic, there's a picture of a whole legion of horses. This is a symbolic comic. There's not a military conflict. It's just kind of an old school picture of a symbol with horses as far as the eye can see. And you remember those kind of like regal, medieval looking horses. You would see special decorations, not just the saddles on them, but they were prepared. They had, you know, and up top each horse was a rider. A rider, you know, from classical times that looked fit, strong, powerful, and there were so many that the first few horses you saw people, but then they become silhouettes. And so you just see horses as far as the eye can see. But then in the comic, your eye is drawn to a horse in the foreground. This horse is unlike all the others because it is the most decorated. It is kind of the most regal stallion, the strongest horse, but on top of the horse, there is no rider. The most powerful horse is the only one that does not have a human rider. And do you know what the subtitle of that comic said? It said, where are you, Salahuddin? Where are you, Salahuddin? And I would argue to you 
with all full respect to the great leader of this Ummah, Salahuddin Rahimahullah, that when we imagine that comic, because in our school there is change that needs to happen that's not happening, that is wishful thinking. When we imagine that because our families are broken or strained or have work to do and we're waiting for Salahuddin to fix it, that is wishful thinking because we are not carrying our responsibilities. When we see the Ummah in pain, when we see humanity looking for leadership, when we see causes of social justice and we imagine that our problem is that that horse doesn't have a rider, no, dear brothers and sisters, the problem is us and the problem is our horses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yugayru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayru ma bi anfusihim. That indeed, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. So the conditions that bring about great leaders like Salahuddin, leaders for our schools, leaders for our homes, leaders for our families, leaders for our campuses, leaders for our societies that are plagued with perhaps the most morally bankrupt group of political leaders in human history. Those are ultimately a reflection of your heart and mind. That is not to say that we own the sins that are committed by generals and leaders. It is to say that in the tradition of the companions of Rasulullah that we own a part of the pain that is around us. That we own a part of allowing our human family to drift to this level that that happened on our watch that it happened on our silence. So in fact, our views, our Qur'anic views of heroes are not about individuals, are not about just remarkable speakers or dynamic individuals. They're very much the heroic acts of people, everyday people, good people, that plant those seeds from which that fertile ground sprouts the likes of the Sahaba, the likes of Salahuddin, the likes, inshallah, of these bright young minds that are reclaiming the conscience of America and the conscience of the world today. When our Prophet وسلم, was going about calling his people to Tawheed, seeking to bring about change in the society around him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted him when he faced a wave of opposition that he never imagined and did not expect. And to be clear, this opposition did not happen from everyone in Quraysh. It did not happen from every person that didn't accept Islam. But it happened from some, and it happened from people that the Prophet ﷺ would have never expected it from. I want to be clear that us as readers of the seerah, it's easy for us to hate the bad guys of the story. Because we know how the story ends. I have to admit to you, a bit guilty and embarrassing, but as a younger child, when I first read the books of Sirah and I read about Abu Jahl for the first time, you know how your mind conjures an image? In my mind, Abu Jahl actually had horns growing out of his head, right? It's just a child's imagination, right? And Abu Jahl didn't, he was a human being, but for me as a child, what was I seeing? I was seeing a man who was unrepentantly evil, right? Willing to kill and murder. He just wanted that throne, that status. He was willing to burn the whole world. Just like the Fir'auns of yesterday and today that we see around us. So as a child, I imagined someone that wasn't a human, that looked like a scary figure, that looked like a monster, reflecting the monstrous heart that was within him. 
But you and I, we read the seerah knowing how it turns out. For the Prophet wasallam, he dined at the same table as these people. He worked in the same market. He was raised by these people. He, if anyone knew him, it was them before the rest of the world. His own uncle Abu Lahab, our Prophet wasallam, trusted his daughters in marriage to his family. You don't marry into a family that you don't trust. And then these people, they backstabbed him, harmed him, targeted his family, slandered him, opposed him, harassed him. And our Prophet ﷺ was seeking to understand and comprehend this oppression. Just like I know right now, it is incredibly difficult for students across the country, for professors, for people, common folk, everyday people that are suddenly being faced with hatred, opposition, anger from people that said that they were their friends or their employers, or their teachers, or their professors. This Qur'anic message is for you and I as it was for the Prophet ﷺ. This verse comes in Surah Al-An'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ شياطين الإنس والجن يوحي بعضهم إلى بعض زخرف القول غرورا ولو شاء ربك ما فعلوه فذرهم وما يفترون من سورة الأنعام الله says what means and thus have we made for every prophet enemies, opposition, resistance. Allah describes them shayateen, devilish human beings uh, and jinn that whisper to one another with eloquent words of deception. And if your Lord, if it had been His will, they would not have done such a thing, so leave them and their deceit. Dear brothers and sisters, as we unpack the layers of meaning in this verse, notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not an embellishment of human words, not an, uh, an assessment of someone, not a personal grudge, Allah who sees the hearts of a people, goes beyond labeling some people, some good people make mistakes. Some good people make big mistakes. Some people redeem themselves. But then there are people that unrepentantly just want to see the world burn. There are people that will step on the necks of anyone for another vote and another dollar. And Allah Most High calls these people shayateen, devilish creatures. And interestingly, we know that the shaytan himself is from the jinn. The Satan, Iblis, who would become shaytan, is from the jinn. And yet in the Qur'an, Allah mentioned human beings before the jinn among the, in, uh, among the shayateen. Why? Why would Allah mention devilish people before devilish jinn from whom the shaytan himself comes? The commentators on the Qur'an among what they share is that the extent of what the devil does is what? Al-waswasa. Whispers, invitations, ideas. In Surah Ibrahim, the Qur'an tells us about the khutbah of shaitan at the end of times in hellfire where he himself disavows his own followers. And what does he say? وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي I had no authority over you except that I invited you and you answered me. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُ أَنفُسَكُمْ Until the end of the verse. So do not blame me but blame yourselves. But a human being, when they are corrupted, when they are destroyed, when their heart is uncentered and bankrupt, they can do much more than waswasa. They can argue, they can deceive, 
They can lie. They can twist and manipulate. They can torture, kill, cause harm, and destroy. So Allah warned of the, de the dangers of these devilish human beings who Allah distinguished from people that would make mistakes, people that would go astray. He described this group with this stirring language. But Allah also described their speech as Zukhruf al qawl Zukhruf in the Arabic language is close to the English word gilded, G-I-L-D. For some of our students that study periods of history, they'll hear of a period called the Gilded Age. Something gilded in English is something that is golden on the outside, but it could be a rock or something else on the inside, just a shell. Zukhruf in Arabic is a step more than this. It is what is beautiful on the outside, but its inside is facid, it's corrupt and empty. So Allah describes their tower of lies as Zukhruf al qawl corrupt speech, but that is embellished, that is pushy, that is overwhelming, that is, you know, you see this brutality on campuses. This is Zukhruf. It is compelling at first, but it is empty. If it is resisted, principally and prophetically, ultimately good hearts prevail, even if after a time. And what happened was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one hand, comforted the heart of our Prophet As if this verse reminded him that he was neither the first nor the last that was harmed in the way of supporting society and justice. And I want to say this is not a call to bravado or foolishness. For students and young people that are reclaiming the conscience of America, we encourage you to reach out to civil rights organizations, lawyers, specialists, seek guidance and act. Know that everyone in the opposition is looking for the one foolish action to become the story. And so we have to, in that pain, hold the highest standards of moral grounding, of ethics, of acting appropriately. And among these efforts also is the responsibility of the broader community to support especially young people at this critical hour. You see, mashallah, there has been a legal uh, defense fund by CARE, Muslim Legal Fund of Organization in USCMO, that leaders can reach out to where lawyers are connected with those that have been targeted with criminal charges for standing and peacefully protesting the atrocities going on in Gaza and then the rest of the world. So this is a responsibility. And I want to say, especially to the haters and spies that I know watch this, this programming, you're not the only ones that graduated from an Ivy League university. You're not the only ones. Actually, many people hear their bed, sweat, and tears built a lot more of this country and this world than some of the talking heads that make a cheap dollar and a cheap vote. And part of what's being demonstrated around us is that many families like those here that have been blessed with opportunities of education, wealth, growth, see a vision in the world where that can be a source of goodness for others where what Allah has given them in their pockets can be a source of opportunity for others. That they see a vision of the world where the only way to get ahead is not by otherizing and destroying others, but that you can grow the pie that is feeding yourself for others. This is an important message that humanity overall is thirsty for at this hour. I don't want to close with this invitation and this example. One of the remarkable moments, among many, that remind us of the remarkable sincerity of the Prophet ﷺ, is that before he faced this opposition, before some of his compatriots and countrymen and friends turned this ugliest of faces, he was not someone that was seeking position or power. Just as, mashallah, many of the young leaders you see today, with all full respect 
to our brothers and sisters that have family and loved ones in the Holy Land, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish, and otherwise, that are in harm's way, right? Which brings another level of pain. When you visit these encampments, you see that the majority of people are not Palestinian. The majority, or many, are not even Muslim. You see many upstanding American Jews standing forward and putting it on the line. Why? Because right is right. And wrong is to be resisted and is to be changed. And so our Prophet وسلم, others in Arabia were seeking fame and fortune. Our Prophet وسلم, never imagined or desired prophethood. But he also did not realize at that moment that in fact, everyone who called to this in history and segment of the ugliness of humanity would resist them. So after Angel Jibreel came to him, and he came down from the mountain, overwhelmed. And he entrusted his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, who advised him, not only with her support and her confidence, but to consult an old man named Waraqat ibn Nawfal. And in fact, my closing message to you is to claim your Waraqa moment, and you'll see why. Waraqa was an old blind man with white hair at this point. He was one of the few of what are called the Hunafa or the Hanifs of Arabia that had a loose understanding of the last remnants of the most recent Prophet, Prophet Isa, Jesus, son of Mary. So they had a general understanding of monotheistic worship. They did not worship the idols, but they did not have scripture or guidance. So he recognized the Prophet ﷺ before the Prophet knew the message that had come to him. And Walaqa said that Annamus, meaning the keeper of secrets, the angel J Jibreel or Gabriel, has come to you who came to Moses before. And then Walaqa makes the most incredible intention. And I want to invite you at this moment to make your own intention in his legacy. Waraqa, as he's explaining this, he says, Ya laytani fiha jada'a Laytani akunu hayyan idh yukhrijuka qawmuk He said, how I wish that I was a young man at the top of my health. I wish that I would be alive for the day when your people cast you out. Faqala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our Messenger وسلم, said, Will they cast me out? Our Prophet وسلم, was not seeking fame or fortune, but from his sincerity, his honesty, his decency, he could not imagine the ugly face that would be turned from some of his fellow countrymen. And Waraqa says, Naam, Lam yati rajulun qat. Yes, none has come with the likes of what you come with, except that they are resisted. And then listen to his closing words, which we close with. Listen to this opportunity to have your, this convention, to make your intention in your home, in your community, in your service, in your family, in the fabric of social justice. How many times have we talked about these opportunities? What we would do, what we would say, well that opportunity has come to you and me now. That opportunity has visited our doorstep and these opportunities come briefly in life. And he closes, وَإِنْ يُدْرِكْنِ يَوْمُكْ if I witness your day, I shall surely support you with all I have. But the will of Allah was that Waraqa did not live to that day. He passed away a short time after this, as if Allah kept him alive for this moment. For that reason, among the scholars are whom that say that Waraqa will be brought forth on the day of judgment as an ummah unto himself, that with this intention, he intended to support in the moment that came to him. 
and Allah honored him to either be the first of this ummah or in fact an ummah unto himself, a nation to himself. And this is our waraqa moment. This is likely our waraqa intention. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq and ability to support this critical moment in history, in the lives of those suffering under oppression, and indeed in the collective cry of humanity for justice.